semi recreation of the Glenn Strange. Frank, this is the Glenn Strange Frankenstein hippies from Abbott Costello made Frankenstein. This gentleman, Joseph here, was here enough to, to volunteer. Uh, the reason we had a mold from this particular piece is years ago in the uh, well, middle 70s, we did a show on the Universal Tours called uh, Land of a Thousand Faces, and we picked people out of the audience and make them into the Frankenstein monster or the bride, and the bride of Frankenstein. Uh, and we found that the Glenn Strange headpiece fit more guys than anybody else. Um, you always have to mix and match a little bit here. Obviously, the best way to do this is to have an impression of this gentleman's head, and we sculpt something to form fit him. But uh, we'll get we'll get something going here. That give him a Frankenstein. Problem with makeup demonstrations is there's so much time trying to make the stuff work, and there's not a lot new to say about it while you're doing it. But and a little head here. This one's a little small for him, so we're using the tape just to. Give us an edge. Looking for the other's thing of neck pulls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, hey. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't work under these conditions. <laughs> Uh, will my assistant step forward, please? This is the person that does all the work. This is Joyce Unruh. I just stand in for the Bud Westmore shots with the brush. <laughs> <laughs> a little surgical tape here for a short kit. This is Pax, one of the newer inventions. Dick Smith invented this, the famous makeup artist. It's something they really didn't have to work with when they did this kind of makeup. Pax is um, acrylic paint mixed with the, um, an adhesive, and it makes a nice flexible paint. We could do his whole face with Pax, but it is difficult to, to get off, so we'll be doing the rest of the makeup after I blend this with, with uh, makeup. I've been very lucky on the show that I'm doing CSI because the people that have been cast to be all our bodies and people that are killed in various ways. They've all been very good. Now, and a lot of times there are beautiful young ladies who are not into having stuff glued to their face, but uh, they've all been very nice. So it's... Uh... Hey, John, is, this the before Wait, is, there, is there a picture up here? <laughs> just a minute. Just a minute. Oh, oh, yeah. so, okay. You've already had yours done, haven't you? Yeah, no, I'm doing my Bud Westmore thing. <laughs> he can say that. I actually had some neck bolts that were closer to Glenn Strange's in uh, the movie next door, but uh, I think they're on the floor somewhere. Um, but. Uh, these are good neck. When you make a sculpture of a neck bolt or a headpiece or anything, you can run a negative mold on it, and if you just paint rubber into that mold and pull it out, it's what's called a slush cast. It's the way you make a clown nose or something like that. Obviously, it's better if you have uh, the two halves of the mold and you're injecting something that has form to it. But for neck bolts, a, a quick slush cast is fine. It probably wouldn't be critical on this particular urethane piece, but when you're uh, making up rubber pieces, the foam rubber that I spoke of a minute ago, if you don't, if you use ordinary makeup on it, uh, like a grease-based makeup uh, that you might buy at a makeup store or whatever, it looks great for a while, and you can get a nice match between the piece and the face, but actually ordinary makeup that has a grease base will begin to attack the rubber, and after about an hour or so, it'll change color, and you'll see right where the makeup stops and, and right where the face starts, uh, or the piece starts. So we use, uh, we use a makeup that's made with castor oil in it, real thick makeup. It's also good if you stove up, too, it helps. <laughs> 
Thank you, Bob. No. No. <laughs> it's uh. What if you have electric range, Bob? No. <laughs> well, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I just thought I'd put some humor just in here since it doesn't seem to even need a room. <laughs> the monster's just gone. You're going to get me later, man. <coughs> Make that line go away with the headpieces. Do you just kick the makeup on heavy? I am right now. Normally, we'd, we'd do a buildup of latex. Oh, really? Sometimes you even take a little Kleenex. That's a good bit. But, you know, we, we, this can't take forever here tonight. So, uh, actually, I just put a little tape here that both holds it in. I'll be laying a little hair here for the sideburn area. So. But, uh, you know, one of these years, what we ought to do is like, get a cast of, say, whoever wants to do this and really make make something that form fits and do a perfect uh, rendition of something. This is this red sponge is stipple sponge, which is invaluable. The thicker makeup just doesn't work on a regular sponge. Told him yet? Did you have to cut his eyelashes off? Yeah. <laughs> Remember when we? It's been a while since I did this so quickly, but sorry. Uh, when we were doing that show at Universal in the, I guess it was 74, 75. Um, it was a lot of fun because we had a, we would be making up, do a quick 20 minute makeup like this, and, and we, Frank and so we pick a couple out of the audience and then do her as a bride. We had a different conception of the bride. But they wouldn't see each other until the end of the makeup, and then we flip the chairs around. And uh, it was always a crowd pleaser. Glenn Strange Monster, most of them don't have too much shading, but it's there, and it helps us in this case to help disguise the headpiece a little bit. Give him a little bit more character, which he will have only in years to come. And there's no reason to rush it. Uh, is the eyelids? You know, uh, eventually they were they were made as pieces. By the time Glenn Strange did the film next door, I think, but um, it was laid on the uh, the eyelids. It was cotton, and uh, or actually. Uh, well, everybody says wax. I think the tests were done in wax, particularly on the original car. But wax really doesn't stay there very long. I think, uh, what am I trying to say? The, the watercolor paper, the Japanese watercolor paper. Yeah, yeah rice paper. <laughs> Powdering this down, the one thing about this uh, caster-based makeup is so shiny and it gets on everything. Necessary for all makeups, translucent powder. Can do them without it. Kind of rushing. We'll try and lay in some sideburns here. Why not? There was. Um, there was the Peter Fonda Frankenstein. Not a lot of people have seen that one either. But, uh, <laughs> I'm going to use the medical adhesive here. There's a lot of ways to lay hair, and this is probably not one of them. But. When the actors get a little restless, which you always do, though, is, uh, you give them something to do. You want to hold that. See, then they feel like they're. <laughs> This is the way they used to lay beers, of course. 
for the lace pieces where we're so wide. It's brand new. A western and things like that. Yeah, you know, land. Land here all day. Good timing. What is Frankenstein gray or is Frankenstein green? Okay, here's this is my theory. I don't have all the facts to support it. But in black and white, in early days of black and white and orthochromatic film, you chose a color like that so it would read a real light gray on the grayscale. It's odd that it does, but it does. It's, it's a high, almost a highlighted gray. It looks like a dead body. Now, the first three films and the Karloff makeup pretty much have that color in the makeup. And I'm not even sure that uh, the... I guess some dispute here, but I, I suspect the Lon Chaney Phantom of the Opera had a little bit of that color in it for early black and white. Then panchromatic uh, film comes in, which is black and white, but it's more of a, a truer representation of colors on the grayscale, if that makes any sense. And Bob remembers by the time that they did Glenn Strange, it may not have been quite this dark, it wasn't, but it was a gray color, it was a sky gray color. By that time, it red is gray, gray red, more is gray. But it, if nothing else, Frankenstein's monster in the movies proves what a ridiculous concept colorizing movies is. It's the only medium where colors were chosen for the way they'd read on the grayscale. And when you go and colorize a movie, you get those colors, but that's not the idea. Uh, the Frankenstein monster is not necessarily supposed to be green. He's not supposed to be moldy. It's supposed to be dead body parts. Uh, there's a movie called... Um, a Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, again, the, the, the colors that were chosen to do the Santa Claus makeup on Ed, Edmund Gwynn, uh, they work in black and white. It was a beautiful black and white movie. You colorize that, it doesn't, doesn't look right at all. So, like Superman's costume was brown? So. Yeah, exactly. This wasn't by accident. A lot of, they were chosen to read. Uh, they had a lot of trouble when they first did this, Pierce did, because... They didn't know what was... Well, it has to read differently than somebody else's flesh tone. So you had to do something dramatic. You had to make him look like a dead, dead body. And it's, it's harder in black and white. So that's the line, I mean, not line greening, but, but that green worked out really well. So I, we always had this argument up at Universal. Oh, I hate you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right back in. Oh. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll be hanging around here. If anybody has any questions or wants to come up and talk, we'll be here. This is great. Uh, uh, this is a quickie, Frank. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, little boy. What? What? <laughs> Can we get into the cook in the kitchen for a second? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. John, 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 you too. Oh, yeah. Wait, hold on. Ready? Yeah, give me the moment. Hold on. And I'll be Bud Westmore. Get out!